my own gums. It's not about kits. It's about creating a new culture when it comes to club branded apparel. How do we then speak to the different communities that make up the whole club? It's the energy and charisma that comes out of South London that really builds us. We're like the loudest in the room. You know, you go somewhere, is anyone from North, West, East? And as soon as you see South London, it's, ah, it's crazy, <laughs> right? Like that is just our thing. Yeah, it's my mates, what's happening, what's good? I'm Thomas Griffin and you are locked into my own garms. On this week's set, our guest is the very trailblazing Kenny Anand Jonathan. I first came across Kenny through his sports marketing agency, The Mail Room, where he reps some of the steeziest athletes and bowlers in the business. In the summer of 2023, he was signed by Crystal Palace FC in the groundbreaking position of club creative director. He's held real varied positions at the intersection of sport and fashion, and we're gonna dig down into all that stuff today. If you're new around here, then whilst you're watching, make sure you subscribe to the channel. We've got loads of ACE episodes for you to go back and listen to and plenty more to come in this series. Follow us on Spotify, sub on YouTube, sub on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get yours. We've got new apps out Tuesdays and then the Fitbit breakdowns a little bit later on in the week. Right, let's do it. This is My Own Garms with Kenny and Ann Jonathan. Kenny, what's happening, dude? How are you? I'm good. Yeah? Very good, thank you very much. Thanks a million for making the trip up here, man. I know it's a bit of a busy schedule for you at the moment. Off to New York tomorrow, is it? I am off to New York Extreme, tomorrow. Extreme, mate. <laughs> Boyhood dream stuff? Yeah. A lot's happened in a short space of time. I know, man. Just connecting the dots at the moment. Must have got a lot busier since the summer, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell us a little bit more about the role that I mentioned in the intro. Yeah. The Crystal Palace creative director. Yeah. You know, interesting role. Um, outside of like the headlines, I think it's just a beautiful opportunity to help us to build community through different mediums. I think some people are not looking at it like that. It sounds very shiny, which is great, but I think with the main focal point based on apparel design, it's not just about, it's not about kits mm. per se, it's about creating a new culture when it comes to, you know, club branded apparel. And how do we then speak to the different communities that make up the whole club? For years, since the beginning of time, should I say, football clubs have tried to sell sportswear to people that enjoy sports from a leisure perspective or a viewing perspective and get them to wear what athletes wear during training on match days. It's not really comfortable. It's, people want to look good. They want to feel great. And sometimes you go to a club store and things are very basic. I think the good thing with conversations like what we're having here is how do we kind of change and redefine that? You know, like so many people have different entry points into sports and football that isn't necessarily as a purist. Sometimes it could be just for fashion purposes. You've seen a footballer that looked good and spoke well and you just wanted to find out more. And, you know, imagine going into like a club store and wanting to buy a product that you could use, you know, in and outside of, you know, match days. And for instance, you looked at product like an Amy Leon door. Like they have the aesthetic down to a T from head to toe. And that could represent an everyday Crystal Palace or said club like outfit. And I think that's where the approach is. How do we then one tell stories through the product and apparel that we have and the offerings that we that we have there? But then the other thing is that as time goes on, speak to other communities and service the other um you know, the other needs or offerings within the club that has been left out for a very long time. The two, well, a few things you mentioned in there that I think are really interesting. I think you have a rich history of storytelling being one of them, which I think we're going to it's touch true. on a bit later yeah. on, and community being another. But the role, you were the first person to be signed in that role to a Premier League club. And uh, now, we just mentioned before we started rolling, the other clubs uh, starting to look for people in that area. I think Liverpool was the one that I saw on LinkedIn uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. asking for it. And who was the other one that you said? Um, Newcastle. In Newcastle yeah. as well. I've got a bit of money to chuck about as well. Man, <laughs> so. um, yeah, man. I mean, where where did that role come from? I know in America, it's a little bit more of a cultural norm that these big um, internationally famous sports teams have got these kind of people. And do you think Palace looked at what 
people were doing in the States and thought, we'll have a bit of that as well. Well, I, I, okay, it's the funny thing, it wasn't Palace who approached me, I approached Palace. Okay. So. Yeah, so I've been working with Palace, obviously, for a number of years because of Wilfred Zaha, obviously, who was my first client. And um, I've done a lot of things with Palace over the years. Like, we, me and Wilf had a clothing line together. We then mm. sold it in the Crystal Palace Club store. Yeah. And it done extremely well. You know, one thing that we was always told there is, like, it's nothing that they would traditionally do, but why did it sell so well? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because there's a story behind it. We're not just selling product that looks good, which it did, and it felt great, but ultimately was attached to something which was Wilf's story, and the brand was called Long Live. Yeah. When I had approached them, I spoke to them about this probably about six years prior, um, just saying that I think there's a space for like a cultural, uh, well, there's a cultural gap. And I think sometimes clubs are missing out on, on, on huge conversations when they're not servicing all the people that make up the club. And um, what happened is like literally word for word of what I'm doing now is what I had pitched them six years ago to Steve Parrish and the, the marketing team. Um, and then what happened is I think NSS magazine had released an article somewhere mid last year that said, do sports teams need creative directors? And then I also then sent that over to the guys. Keep in mind, I had pitched this six years ago. And this is where they spoke about Ronnie Feig, New York Knicks, Daniel Arsham, Cleveland Cavaliers, Guillermo, 424 for um, MLS. You've got Don C at Chicago Bulls and you've got Luigi Velasenor at the Arizona Coyotes. And I was like, look guys, this is a real thing now. And this was before we even, I even saw any of this, but I think because I was immersed in it and obviously with, you know, the mailroom and, and what I do there and my background, I guess, within fashion and just trying to be a bit more conscious, I've always seen that this is where we're going. If I'm doing this for the athletes, how do we tell stories on a bigger scale? And naturally it would have been the clubs would have been the next move. Hence the reason why I'd approached them saying, look guys, I think we can do this. Um, so yeah, when I done it, you know, at the time, I think the ground was becoming a bit more fertile because athletes are having a bit more expression over their social medias, um, taking a lot of the conversations and fashion stories into their own hands. And um, I just wanted to be able to service it. You know, football is like the biggest global sport but it has in terms of its interactions with fashion probably lagged behind a lot of the big american sports yeah in the past couple of years i was talking to your mate any about this when she was on like the kind of tunnel walk fashion parade has become mm -hmm. a bit of a bigger thing in the nba mm -hmm. it's long Massive. been a part of the mm -hmm. thing and you know if someone i, I love football i'm a united fan um, so am I. And, uh, big old <laughs> um, don't tell Palace that <laughs> so like I love football for football but I also like clothes and when those two things intersect like I get a particular excitement and you know seeing all these football stars obviously they've got a lot of disposable income and they can do interesting things with fashion yeah. like, I just find it exciting and do you know what I like more than anything else how it boils the piss of the old football fans who are like, oh, you should be spending all your time training and not expressing yourself like this. I'm Crazy. like, you deserve to be annoyed by this, man. Yeah. And, you know, when Pogba was at United, the, a lot of the discourse around him was like, he should be spending more time rather than bleaching his hair, playing well on the football pitch. And, like, I loved that he kind of poked at that a little bit yeah, yeah, and yeah. thought, I'm going to do me, man. I'm going to do do it in the Paul Pogba way. And was unapologetic with it. And yeah, I love to see it. That unapologetic spirit that some of the guys have to push. And it, it, look, look, I don't, if it's not for everyone, it's not for everyone. That's absolutely fine. Some people just want to, just want to play. And other people, you, you think about it now, flair players. It'd be, for me, it's kind of strange to see some of these these guys are like super expressive on the pitch and expect them not to be the same outside. It's part of their character. Yeah, yeah. they're not going to play like that if they're not that character. You, you always look at it, for instance, people who are the best dribbling or this, that and the third, extremely expressive. Take a Ronaldinho, for instance, right? Yeah. Just like on pitch tile, like the way he wore his shorts, headbands, this, that, like everything about it is expressive. Like you look at, I, I say something like, let's just use Wilfred Zaha, for instance, yeah. and Paul Pogba. Guys that, you know, extremely good with their feet. They love to, you know, to, to put on the display when they when they play. Mm -hmm. Equally off the pitch, they are expressive and experimental with what they wear, where they go and what they do. 
And I think that's dope. Like, you look in the States, you know, there was the whole thing with, like, LeBron James when I think there was a reporter that told him to just shut up and dribble. And it became a whole thing. He built a whole business on the back end of that, which ended up being uninterrupted. And their strap line is more than an athlete, right? All of, off of that shut up and dribble quote. But look how expressive he is. Like, mm. unfortunately, the tunnel walks for us not necessarily a thing. And you can see pla other platforms now is trying to, 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 to kind of like curate their own ones. But also I think that's some commercial stuff. I think when they're walking out, they actually legally have to wear their part, like their sponsored, the, the brand okay. sponsors yeah, yeah. on there. But I think there's other creative ways now that people are doing it. Before you just started off with wash bags. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the wash bag, everyone had a wash bag. It was either Louis Vuitton, Vuitton it might yeah. be Goyard. Yeah, yeah. And you know, now people are, you know, starting to try different things, but then it was the headphones. Mm. But man, I, I love people being able to express themselves. We can't sit here and expect peace, people to, to just do nothing. You yeah. even go into the women's game, like Megan Rapino. Do you know what I mean? Extremely expressive. Mm. And I love that. Sam Kerr, like all of these women are just doing amazing things on and off the pitch. Yeah, man. We chatted briefly before about the Bex doc that we've <laughs> ever in the world watched. Yeah. And how much of a game changer that was. Mm -hmm. And there's a line in that about I think is it is it might be Gary Neville saying like he was always flash like when he was getting a tenner a week he was flash yeah. and that was his personality mm -hmm. and the way he expressed himself on and off the pitch was one it was authentic it was coherent with it but mm -hmm. I think Beckham is only in retrospect being given um, his flowers on that front I think and you you said it best before you know yeah. like. No one's done it to that level yet, and it's nuts, man. Yeah, I think like we've had some great people. We have some great people, but someone to capitalize within football, like the way he has commercially on and off. But again, being the first, and I always say that sacrificial lamb is hard. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He like, paid some prices, yeah, dude. Like you get a lot of people now, and it's doing it. You know, I remember you know when you got like Dominic Calvert Lewin, who was wearing a skirt at one point. But I remember when when Beck's done it and it was like such an uproar. Mm. But even if you think about it, just having a white guy wearing cane rows at that time, <laughs> like it, it would have been extremely controversial, but he done it because of, he found a way to express himself. And I think I, lo I love that, you know, again, we were speaking just before this and I was saying, funny enough, yes, we have many different people that have expressed themselves through time. But then I, you know, part of me is like, does do jobs like mine exist? in the way that they do without people like Beckham, who was trailblazing. Mm. You gotta think about some things like that. Yeah. Can't say yes or no, but I definitely is something up for, for, for discussion, man. But he's done amazing, like, Bex has done amazing things, man. His whole story, even with, with, with Victoria, it's just, the stars aligned at yeah. many different moments, yeah. you know what I mean? And he still looks dope, man. Yeah, yeah, still to this day. Like, I think there was an article saying, is he like the most fashionable like manager in yeah. history now? Yeah. Now, Bex is Bex. He's always going to be that person. Yeah, man. The job that you're in, yep. obviously you came with a good pitch, an enticing pitch to them, but you're not going to walk into that without an impressive resume. Mm. So tell us a little bit about your work prior to the Palace job mm -hmm. with sports and fashion. Well, man, it's such a big thing. It's massive, man. Uh, I have, where should I start? So the Mailroom is an agency I founded, yep. um, which I always say it is a sports marketing agency, but I always say it's a bit of like a false narrative because my objective is really to push, you know, the human element of the athletes. You know, the analytics and numbers and great are great and they contribute to the work that I do. But it's more so about saying, okay, with the people that we represent, how do we find real dope ways to build their profiles outside of the sport? And that could go through philanthropic work, that can go through, you know, media, PR, marketing exercises. We're looking at, you know, how do they control their own narrative of expression? Because for many years, the mainstream media has handled it. And I don't, it's done some great things, but also some terrible things to people that are not deserving of it. So how do we continue to build your story and just really kind of drive you into traditional and non-traditional spaces, but just in a cool way. Like, I think even when we look at the creative around sports, it is very the same. And now, you know, you're finding people when we're doing like storytelling, that haven't come from a sporting space, like it becomes, you know, almost like cinematic 
like I think the best way to kind of express it. And I give you an example, Clint from Cortez, for instance, when he had done his shoe with Nike and he had done the video with, was, who did he do it with? Was it Caravanga? Um, and it was like, I can't remember. Like the way that that video was curated is nothing that traditional sports would have welcomed. But because he's not, coming from that world, he's taken this whole artistic approach and brought it over into sports. And that's what I love. I think it's probably the same with myself. I come from a creative background. I've come here and I'm like, well, there's offerings that come natural to me, but are not natural within the space. How do we just really communicate that through the mediums that we have? And I think the people looking at it appreciate that authenticity. You can see it a mile off, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, with the mailroom, it's like a quite boutique agency Definitely, and you yeah. have a real solid relationship with the people that you do you do work with like Zaha is on your books and yep. you've known and worked with him for a long time and only through that trust and understanding of each other's working practices can you present them in a super authentic way I think that often gets lost when you get people a creative team coming in and just trying to work with someone they don't particularly know yeah, um, yeah. I think sometimes you, when you know someone you know what makes them tick you yeah. know what their do's and don'ts are okay. and it's easy you can see things face value and some things are going to work but I know like even the finer details okay Wolf's not going to be interested in that Mikel's mm. not going to be interested yeah. in that Joshua Boatz he's not going to be interested in that and it's like how do we then fine tune it and tailor it to something that they do that they are interested in but still keep the creative element to it. And I think that's where the trust comes in because these guys have been given media commitments all day long and it's extremely tiring. And sometimes if it doesn't work for them, they get put off because they're like, I've got to do another thing that I'm not interested in that doesn't work for me, but helps the network. Yeah, yeah. How do we still make it cool and be in line with who you are and what your values are and not feel like oh, this is just work for me? Yeah. But you you enjoy the whole process of it. And I think, yeah, that's just where we're at with it. Yeah, man. Mm. And even before the mailroom, you were heavily involved with the fashion world through yeah, yeah, yeah. brand creation. You meant yeah. you had the one that you worked on with Wilf. Yeah. And yeah. you had your own brand. brand. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about that one? <laughs> yeah, long long, that was a long time ago. But yeah. Yeah, I had um, a brand called Play Dot Apparel. Yeah. Um, which I founded maybe like 2007. Mm. So it was like one of the like just like a streetwear brand from the UK we was doing you know relatively well we'd sell like you know um like Harvey Nichols Selfridges and so and so but I guess at that time coming up I think our peers within fashion would have been Trapstar and Ben Jart who were doing extremely yeah, yeah. well and everyone knows how hard fashion is to do and keep be consistent with it but um yeah that's what it was and I think that helped me one to build relationships back then um two to really exercise like my creative flow. I think sometimes, you know, when you're younger, you're just doing it because it's dope. You're not thinking about the business side of it. Yeah. Um, it's just something fun. Um, and then the other side is that, you know, I, yeah, I was doing a lot of creative projects for a lot of different people in different spaces. So just a lot of prominent names in and around London behind the scenes, whether it's brand design, product development, um, drop shipping, like literally anything that I could do to kind of, you know, get my creative like juices flowing. I'd, I'd, I'm, I'm, I was down for it, like hungry at that point. So it's funny for people that haven't seen me in a while. And obviously I stayed quiet behind the scenes is that people that know me from fashion do not know me from sports. I'm probably like one of those people that you say is like, you wouldn't expect to be working in sports. Yeah, yeah. But the people that know me in sports don't necessarily know me for the fashion side. Okay, but it all so, makes sense when, yeah, you, when you put the two sides when you together. Put the two together, yeah. So like, even the other day, I, I had a talk, and someone I had known for years, and they was like, "Okay, he's coming." He said he didn't put two and two together, and he was like, "Oh my gosh, I remember having a conversation with you when you was doing um, play dot." And I was like, "Yeah, years ago." And he's like, "That's so crazy. Now it makes sense why this role makes so much sense." Yeah, man. Um, so yeah, that's the beautiful thing of it, man. Yeah, got a bit of skin in the game, man. But um, I've been working for a while, so. Your ends. You're based here in London. Yes. Whereabouts specifically did you grow up? Yeah. So I'm from Battersea. Okay. Clapham Junction. To okay. Be a bit more specific. South London. South London. South yeah. West London. Born and bred, man. What do you think sets South London apart stylistically from the other kind of north, south, east, west quadrants of the city? What do you see? Or what maybe what did you see here growing up that you might not have saw elsewhere? Yeah, that's so funny. So I think out of 
<laughs> the other areas. Yeah. South London's known for being quite gritty okay. also. But it's the energy and charisma that comes out of South London that really builds us, I would say. We're like the loudest in the room. You know, you go somewhere, is anyone from North, West, East? And as soon as you see South London, it's, ah, it's crazy, <laughs> right? Like that is just our thing. So there's a bit of bravado. There's okay. a bit of ego in there, which mm. is is good. Healthy. Yes, yeah, very healthy. Um, and competition. But for us, it's like we've always been very confident with who we are. Mm. Like being from South London, South West or South East, which funny enough, have are two very different places actually yeah. when you look at it. Yeah. But um, we was actually more so known for our tracksuits, man, back in the days. That's all South London is war. What were you rocking? Just like the standard like Nike tracksuits, the cotton ones, I remember. Okay. Um, like the sweatsuit material. This, yeah. Okay. And I remember even just wearing, um, if you had the open ones that were just more flared, not flared, but just the straight leg open without the cuffs, that was even like a fashion risk. Okay. <laughs> like it was crazy. I remember saying, oh, you've got the, like, the ones that are just open. And it's funny where everyone had the cuffed ones, I'd have the open ones. Okay. And then um, I remember I was probably, I was like the first one out of my core peer group, even wearing jeans. I, I always say it's funny. And I remember getting laughed at. He was like, oh, you're wearing jeans. Why are you wearing jeans for? This Wait. is outside of the norm. This is outside of the uniform that we've kind of designated. Yeah. This is our group's uniform kind of thing. Yeah, like that. Yeah, that's just what it was. But I think even at that point with like, you know, street fashion and streetwear, I kind of looked also to, you know, that I guess that was, I'm probably like a product of, of like the Nego Pharrell era. Kanye, mm -hmm. hence the reason. Yeah, do you know what I mean? It still lives with me now for yep. the nostalgia, yep. but... Like, I'm a product of that. And then we're talking London fashion, which probably at some point was a kickback from US fashion. I remember seeing people like Dizzy Rascal in like academics tracksuits mm. in his music videos and Avrex, thinking Bombers, the Averixes yeah. with like, you know, Lethal B and the guys from East London. Then you have like, again, being from Batsy Clap and Junction, you had like So Solid crew from the same estate that I'm from. And, you know, Mega Man wearing like the bowler hat and they had their TTs again, the Avex jackets. All black everything. All black everything. And it's like, you just grow up and you can just kind of pick and make this kind of like Frankenstein yeah, of yeah. like design, however you'd want to put it. But man, it's, there were so many things. Yeah, So Solid's a weird one because yeah. obviously they got a little bit of money thrown at them, mm -hmm. but they were obviously a, a well-established crew and they did things quite flamboyantly, didn't they? You know, the bowler hat was, that, yeah. that's more... I don't know, maybe like uh, dance hall influenced where the kind of yeah. show personship is encouraged a little bit more than, you know, the standard all black tracksuit or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And because there were so many of them, like they looked so sick, yeah. all in different... Individually, yeah. ...cache with these white oh, bandana gosh, and the white it, contacts. <laughs> like, so dope. Yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, shout out them dudes. They were doing it interesting. <laughs> no, I didn't they, know they were Battersea actually. So yeah, was... man, Battersea born and bred, man. Like majority of them, obviously, apart from Asher D, I believe he's from maybe Peckham or something. Yeah, but yeah, like I remember just growing up in the area, like and just being around the guys from 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 young, and then just getting old enough where you can actually kind of have like personal relationships mm. with them. So yeah, man, just a huge influence in the area. And actually, I, do you know what? I never really give him a shout out like this, right? But there was one guy from my area. He's an older guy. His name's Oni. And at the time, he was running a, a streetwear brand, more so about headwear, called London City De Facto. Okay. And he was like, probably, again, I think he kind of gets pushed under the radar, but like the headwear and what he was doing, you see like how New York has like the New York Yankees hat. Those LC hats at one point was like the crowns for London, like literally everywhere. And um, I'm pretty sure if you go back, you can see a lot of like in a lot of London, like music videos. But he is someone, again, when I was coming up and growing up, I remember like we're friends now, right? Um, I kind of see him as like an older brother. But when I, I remember just being young on my estate and he would walk around with like the bag of hats just trying to sell them for the day. And I remember one time walking into our local shop. That's when I didn't know him and we started talking. He was like, yeah, oh, what'd you do? I was like, oh, just trying to get into fashion, so and so and so. And he just gave me one of the hats. Sick. And, you know, it's those kind of interactions as well where you're like, oh, wow, someone's like showing love or respect from their hard work. But you never forget those interactions. For real, I mean? man. And I mean, it must have been so inspiring for you 
uh, to see someone working that hard to get their own designs out there for Definitely. you know for your for what you've gone on to do in your life. Mm. Um, talk to me a little bit more about this American influence and specifically the kind of like uh, BBC, Babe, mm -hmm. Pharrell era yeah, yeah, yeah so was that all coming from mtv was that coming from just the music you were listening to like mm. yeah i think a mixture of everything i've got an older sister who, who's a musician my family's okay. quite music orientated and i think at that time when you look at that it's not just about fashion well i think one thing i appreciated about Pharrell and ego is more lifestyle yeah so you know they can go from fashion to jewelry to music to physical activations, to books, to home decor. And you kind of like was brought into a whole world and ecosystem of like, of offerings. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what was dope. And I think also where more so gangster rap at that time was like prominent. You had someone like Pharrell who, and Kanye West for instance, that was making music that transcended that. And it allowed us that kind of sat on the cusp in the city, London boys mm -hmm. that are around a lot of stuff but you felt a bit more accepted by that music because you necessarily wasn't involved in the other side. Yeah. So you could see someone like Kanye West who drops an album like College Dropout and it spoke to you because that's what you was going through at the time. And yeah. you know what I'm saying? That like you can still make it regardless of what was happening in, yeah. in, in school and college. Or a Pharrell who was like the cool kid that was still hung around with all like the gangsters and the, you know, the other musicians. Yeah. And I kind of sat somewhere within that space. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like. The clothes that they wore with Bait, Billionaire, Boys Club and Ice Cream was all about expression. And um, yeah, and he skateboarded. Yeah, Do you know man, what I mean? That's another so thing. Like, cool. there's, there's so many like anomalies in there like you yeah. can just pick out. But like black guy skateboarding with all these colours that wasn't doing gangster rap at the time, but still charting, produced rap. Everything, sang, done everything. everything in the charts, man. Are like, you <laughs> yeah. top 40? Probably f eight of them would be Neptune's beats. Oh yeah, year, for man. sure. So sick, so yeah, inspiring. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. Sticking on the geographical topic, mm -hmm. somewhere else that you're deeply attached to, Ghana. Yep. You were over there earlier this year with TED Talks. Yep. I heard this on the Change Africa podcast, pick <laughs> up them lot. Yep. Um, tell us how much of an influence Ghana has had on the way that you've dressed over the years. Yeah, massive. I'll say from a fashion perspective, how can I say it? I can't say heavily, okay. but there's definitely essences within there that you take because everything is about show okay like our, our local like print is a kente print okay Every, it's like oranges and reds and purples and greens you're from near accra yeah i'm from accra right okay. that's what, yeah the capital that's where my, my family are from and um even just going there again there's a sense of pride when you wear traditional wear and sometimes if it's not just from the apparel but there's an attitude that you carry over okay when you're wearing whatever you're wearing but yeah going over to Ghana like I think in my older years and being able to appreciate it as an adult gave me a new sense of identity mm. where I've grown again like in inner city London but at home was very traditional but um so I had the mixture of those two but getting older and being able to experience it the way I have um, man, I've learned so much. Like even being able to do a TED talk in my hometown for me meant more than anything. I probably, you know, no, probably I prefer doing it there than I would over it in London because yeah. it was connected to something. My yeah. fat majority of my family are over in Ghana, so um, no, it's beautiful, man. Such a beautiful place and a beautiful country with beautiful people. So yeah, man. when you go over there, fashion-wise, do you see the young kids doing anything? that you wouldn't, I know we're living in an increasingly globalised world where everyone's yeah. got access to the same internet, but do you see the kids in Ghana doing anything interesting fashion-wise? Oh, massive. Like, um, like right now, like the art, culture, fashion scene and music in Ghana is like thriving. Yeah. And like there's a group of guys that I always have to make sure I give a shout out to. They're um, a collective called Free the Youth. I'm talking for stylistically, like the garments that they wear, what they produce, um, they're involved in so much and actually currently now they are over in um, they're flying over to LA for ComplexCon to, okay. to to release a new collection but they would be like the equivalent of like the Trap Star in London or the Daily Paper in Amsterdam and they're all friends actually so yeah. you know when Virgil was alive like, you know rest in peace he would link up with them a lot um, you know done certain collections with them they've got collaborations with brands like Awake but like really dope. And for me, they're driving like 
fashion culture, street culture over in Ghana. And it, it feels like the early days of streetwear when you're there. It's not like tied in with too much high-end fashion. It feels like when people used to line up yeah. for, you know, like the pop-ups, like reset at Nike and so and so. They, they, they're carrying that element and I love it. Ace, hey, man. I've heard you talk about making, when you started your brand, uh, your, your clothing brand, you were making things for your friends, hyper local mm -hmm. and just for us lot. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it grew to something more national, international, mm -hmm. like when you see kids doing something where it is hyper local and it's not got that influence, it must be, uh, I don't know, make you feel proud, I guess, like, because mm -hmm. that's what you were doing 15 years ago. Or yeah, something like that, man. Yeah, nice. yeah. That's not me. The confidence that you speak with and the way you express your ideas seems really kind of coherent and together and assured. And the way that you express yourself through clothes seems similarly together. But was there ever a fashion period in your life that you look back at and think, nah, that's not me? Skinny jeans. Okay. <laughs> How skinny are we talking? Spray on stuff. Yeah, no, I never done that. But I wore, I wore skinny jeans, which is fine. But man, they're just really uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I remember just being like, I can't go any bigger than this. And now I'm like, I can't go any smaller than this. <laughs> it's crazy how it works, right? Um, another thing that was funny, the era of, remember when everyone was wearing like chinos and, mm. and like blazers? Okay. <laughs> well, I love a blazer, man. I think yeah, my, my, one of I my love first ever trainers, yeah. trainers was a blazer. But yeah, you know, with a chino, it's kind of... I Pre just, preppy look, man. Yeah, it was very preppy look. The preppy look's not necessarily my thing, but again, maybe like Kanye West, you yeah. know, like inspired and Lupe Fiasco. Okay. Kind of like that era. Yeah, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? I, or Kid Cudi, like that was their thing. Yeah, lots of beads. I mean, lots you're of beads. rocking the subtle beadage today, but no, beads played a big <laughs> no, role these, in your outfits. This, my daughter made this for okay, me, actually. Cute. So I rock it wherever I go. It's got oh, my name on it. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Were beads a big part of your fashion choices back in the day? Yeah. Oh, gosh, man. Yeah. It just, it's funny because you probably have beads because you can't afford a chain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's an alternative that makes you look understated, but still has the design value of, mm. you know, another accessory. So... Yeah, it was just something to do. And I remember at the time when, I don't remember like the wooden Jesus pieces were in, again, probably another Kanye West thing. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, like the wooden Jesus pieces were like a huge thing and with the beads on them, so. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, look, I guess it's, again, bridging that gap. If you, if you can't afford the gold chain, then it's doing that Kanye Pharrell thing that you're bridging that gap between Final the alternative, Kanye. alternative, right? Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, make it look fly. Yeah. Um, just tell me a bit more about the mail room. You mm -hmm. mentioned a couple of names. Um, Joshua Boatsy, the boxer. Mm -hmm. uh, you worked with Wilf. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a bit about some of the other people because the mail room looks like a, a really direct bridge between the fashion world and the mm -hmm. sports world to me. Yeah. Um, and maybe focus a little bit on the storytelling aspect because I know that's something that's particularly... Yeah. Um, relevant yeah. to you no okay cool well with the mailroom like i said storytelling big yeah. part of it but like you know there's some real like dynamic cultural elements to the people that we work with strategic sometimes we do have like certain quotas that we want to hit when we're working with our clients but sometimes it's just off a feeling mm -hmm. you know we don't need someone who's on in, in in the top six banging you know 20 30 goals a season sometimes it might be someone who who's not but they've got a really cool story yeah a great look about them and they understand that you know there's an element to them that that, that they could go somewhere else. And I think one of those people is a perfect example is someone like Jan Valery, who was at Southampton. Okay. You know, dressed extremely well, was playing. He was um, a right back. Um, he's now playing for Angers at the moment. We're a multi-sports agency, so it's not. I know football gets picked up a lot because it's, you know, it's, it's the big sport here. But, you know, boxing, Joshua Boazzi, again, extremely, like, talented boxer who came from the Olympics and is doing amazing things. But great story. Um, you look at the likes of um, Mikel Antonio, as I said, Wilfred Zaha. Um, we've worked with the likes of Leon Bailey um, in the past as well. We look after Danielle Carter. And now really within like athletic spaces, yeah, yeah. OJ Odeborum, very interesting in individual who is an amazing track athlete for 100 metres, uh, run for Team GB. And Daryl Nita, who's yeah. again, like phenomenal. Um, she done a shoot. One of my favorite shoots is she done a. Uh, we done a shoot for Circle Zero Eight, 
And listen, the cover for it was amazing. Like amazing. Like uh, her partner, she's an Adidas athlete. Yeah. But she was wearing Dolce and Gabbana in it as well. But like how that shot came out was amazing. And we just love that. It's just that people that understand, look, I believe I have more here. How can you help me to unlock it? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? We don't want to just work with everyone for the sake of working with everyone. Um, we want people that understand the value in what we do. Do you know what I mean? And um, we work together because we understand that, you know, there's there's benefits of us on both ends. And I think that's just the beautiful thing about it. The mailroom is just about delivering a service and that's it, point blank, period. I mean, it must be super exciting for you as someone that likes to tell stories and be creative to have these, I mean... Boxing fandom is quite a different fandom mm -hmm. and culture to athletics. Mm -hmm. And to have all these different mediums for you to tell these stories through must be, mm -hmm. I don't know. If you worked for just a football agency, obviously yeah. you've got people with different stories, yeah. but all these different um, sports, it must, yeah, must make you want to get up each morning and do something exciting. Yeah, because life just changes so fast. Yeah. And I think that's the good thing about it. It's like... You could wake up today, something happens in the media, and then we're like, okay, there's something else for us to do here. Okay. Do you know what I mean? We don't want to wait. The problem is sometimes, well, there's nothing wrong with being reactive, as long as that's not the only thing you do. You've got to be proactive in finding those stories also. Yeah. You spend a lot of time with someone, you'll find out, what, like I said earlier, about what makes them tick. And saying, okay, how do I latch on to that and then just amplify the story or your voice in different platforms? I think in, in track and boxing, you know, as well, the reason why it's more interesting outside of football is because they don't stereotypically have the platforms for expression. You know, we don't, in, in, here in London or the UK, we don't have a lot of like multi sports platforms that allow athletes to express themselves um, from a more creative standpoint. You can go over to football and be in like a soccer Bible or a gaffer magazine. Boxing and athletics don't have that. Yeah, they have yeah. athletics weekly and that's, yeah. you know what I'm saying? The problem is that the traditional followers or the purists, as I say, don't care for that at all. Mm. So for me, the reason why it's more challenging in those sites, spaces is because we have to then create the platforms yeah. and the mediums and the content and then feed it to non-traditional platforms. Right now, probably most people will only know Dina Asher-Smith. But you can't know Dina without knowing Daryl. But commercially, Dina has, you know, a lane that's carved out for her. With Daryl, who again, equally is like up there as joint within our country's, you know, top sprinters, like yeah. close one to two with, with Dina, especially over the last year or two. Yeah. But when we want to tell her stories, we can't go to none of the traditional platforms. So do you know what we do? We find artistic ways to tell her stories through fashion, her family, and, 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 with sports in it, and we might take it to a Wonderland magazine. Yeah. We might take it to a Dazed, yeah. and we tell those stories on those platforms also. So it's a challenge, man, but a good challenge that we're up for. Do you know what I think would be a good way for her to tell a story? Talk to me. Get on uh, a podcast such as My Own Garden. <laughs> <we're gonna talk. laughs> That's the next one Fuck then, right? Up, there we go. Listen, it's already done. All right. It's already Look forward done. forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> Top three selected. In the first series, we had any pick her top three best dressed footballers. Mm. As we've established, you work with a lot of footballers, but also boxers, track athletes, mm -hmm. field athlete, track and field athletes. Uh, on a top three, steeziest sports stars, any sport. Any sport. Okay, so Stefan Diggs or Stefan Diggs. Tell me a little bit more about Stefan Diggs. I don't know Stefan Diggs. Okay, so he's, a, he's, he's an NFL player. Okay. But um, again, just has a very unique sense of style. Okay. Um, and do you think uniqueness is the thing that you that you particularly yourself like to see? Yeah, because it's like I said, fashion is one thing. How you carry it is another. Yeah, like yeah. how what like how you wear your clothes. As I said, you can get the same outfit on three different people yeah, and it's worn yeah. three different ways. And I think when I see him down to like he's very expressive, like or, or or very risky, should I say? Okay. So sometimes when he wears certain things with like 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 cropped like tees with like oversized like denim trousers and you know the color tones and accessories that he has the brands again outside of traditional and there's nothing wrong with him again with the chrome hearts he might go one above and you would see okay oh he's he's he gets it because he's gone for that why has he gone for that like why has he gone for that brand he's 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 really thinking about what he yeah, puts on yeah the other one I said was Timothy Weir. Okay, son of George, the great George Weir. Yes, exactly. Um, plays for USA and I might be at Juventus as well, you know. Okay. But like, I think he's, um, again, amazing. 
very expressive and he raps too which is yeah Sick. yeah he raps like but I, again i just love like the confidence in how he carries himself that's yeah. just the real thing for me yeah like wearing clothes is one thing the attitude and persona behind it is a whole different ball game yeah yeah so he's an, he's another one for me i love i mean yeah athletes that are doing something different off the pitch whether it be rapping mm -hmm. uh you know, we saw Memphis doing his, right, yeah. he's, he's got tunes out at the moment, 100%. dresses flamboyant. Yeah. So he, he's doing these things on the pitch that are flamboyant and uh, incredible to watch mm -hmm. and entertaining. What do we watch sport for? Entertainment, yeah, yeah. you know. And then off the pitch, mm -hmm. it all adds up. It's all part of the same whole, I think. Yeah. And I admire that in athletes, I think, yeah, as well. Yeah, it yeah. sounds like the two that you've picked out so far embody that to yeah, a certain yeah. extent now the other one's tricky for me but I've got to give it to my guy actually because I was going to say Moise Keane and he's dope by the way okay. but I've got to give it to Zaha yeah man yeah I have to like I was thinking <laughs> what am I doing like I have to and the reason why I say that and maybe because I have the you know the honour of being around him and understanding him right Wilf would put on something he'd be like what is that and he'd be like I don't know I bought on ASOS like, do you know what I mean? He has it's no like, boundaries. It's not, yeah, it it's good. not just yeah. about, you know, the brands. And of course, we love brands and because, you know, they, they put more time and effort into like shape, size, silhouettes and so on. But, but man, like Wilf can put together an outfit effortlessly. Yeah. Like genuine, I've seen this guy fling on stuff and I'll be like, how have you made it look that good? Like he, he just looks so comfortable in what he wears because he knows himself. Mm. And he's unapologetic about what he wears and not about who it offends, but more so the critiques. Yeah. And again, it's the same about on the pitch. Like, Wilf is just himself yeah. regardless. So for me, I have to give it to Wilf, actually, 100%. Big up to... Uh, yeah, yeah, big him up every time, man. Wolf That's my United. For sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was his birthday on the 10th. So happy belated as well to Happy him. birthday. Yeah, 10th of November. <laughs> Next little question. I've heard you talk with proper passion about your faith on other podcasts. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's not something generally that clothes play a big part in or that people think clothes play a big part in. And it might seem a little bit frivolous to connect something so deep and meaningful with mm -hmm. something that some people think isn't deep and meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, but is there something special about dressing up in finery to celebrate and being part of a religious community for you? Yeah, I think every like again, every community has their ways of expressing themselves. Okay. I think also um my faith, yes, is a big part of who I am and how I express myself. For me, being a follower of Christ or believer in God as the ultimate creator, like and especially that I believe that we was made in God's image. Mm. How I create, if we're made in his image and God is, you know the all who made creation there's elements that we can tap into in that sense too so again when it comes to the designing outside of things i keep that part of it because i do also believe it is a, a god's given gift for me personally i would say like meaning like my interest in it not to say like oh i'm this super designer yeah but the element of creativity i don't just see it as just something i'm doing i definitely do see in it as an honor you're channeling 100 yeah. percent and then that just goes into the form of expression, allowing me to connect with, you know, how I feel, that emotional side of it or the spiritual side of it. Mm. There are, for me, sometimes there's parts of modesty that I want to uphold yeah. in, you know, when it comes to sometimes how we style men and women, everyone has the way of they expressing themselves. Yeah. But for me, sometimes there's just ways of being creative in all elements where sometimes there might be a bit more skin shown here or this, that. We're like, how do we then create this, but it represents this person in this way? There's yeah. so many different elements to it. So yeah, for me, my faith is a big part of it because it's ideally my identity. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's not two separate things. It's almost... It all, seems, all is it has to be yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah we can't live two separate lives yeah it's, it's all one and seamless man yeah. so yeah it, that's interesting because i don't really get a lot of questions on that okay so that's good yeah right. but that that definitely is a plays a big part in 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 what i do who i am mm. for sure and have you got a sunday best is church where um your usual wear or do you get something else out when you're going to church? <laughs> so it's funny, I used to wear a lot of like more formal wear and I told my pastor, listen, 
the tyres on the Sunday was just uh, yeah was a bit restricting. Yeah, when you're not used to wearing that in the week, I can see how it might. Change. Yeah, so like for me, like they'll know as soon as church, I'll take my tie off <laughs> and it's <laughs> off. But now, no, like I kind of you know dress how I feel. I go there just still even in 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 a respectful manner. Yeah, but there's not. I think you know I. I go there, I can go out, I'll go there in this if, yeah. I, if I needed to. I think, again, that's the beautiful part of it, being accepted for who you are and how you dress. Do you get what I'm saying? I Obviously, saying. I, you know, some people, you know, not going to walk in there half naked and that's yeah, just out yeah. of respect. Yeah. But I think, you know, for the most part, it's just being able to be who you are in that space, but also being respectful of the space you are in. It's just like, again, I say, obviously we know religion, like my belief and, and, and faith is very different to work, but you work into, you walk into your workplace and there's certain standards that you uphold because you're in, you know, the people, the community that you're in and yeah. it's the same there. But I just, I'm also very expressive. My pastor knows that he's always teasing me about it. Like I've come and he's always like, oh, what's this you've got on? Mispronouncing the brands that I'm wearing. But yeah, no, definitely. It's mad, man. Cause I, I went to Catholic school when I was yeah. little and um, you know, people dress up in what they think is quite staid, quite um, respectful, modest or whatever mm -hmm. to go to church. And then you see what the priests wear in and it's like the most flamboyant thing you've ever seen. <laughs> the colours, the patterns, the colors, yeah, like yeah. the shapes of it. It's yeah. nuts, man. It's a mad, like... Contrast, yeah. Yeah, yeah mad contrast. Yeah, just however anyone wants to express themselves, you know, I'm... I'm Specialness, I'm, isn't it? It's like yeah, yeah. showing the, the specialness of this, the, the ceremony. Of yeah, 100%. Yeah, my, my boss is like quite subtle, if I'm honest with you. Yeah. And that's intentional. It's just him as a person. Yeah. Very subtle, very subtle, but he might have something small. Yeah. Nothing Sub crazy. Yeah. Subtle Louis Vuitton. <laughs> <laughs> he, he would not be wearing no Louis Vuitton, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> know you've been in the new job with palace for a relatively short time what mm -hmm. like months four yeah. five months yeah. or something like that but it must be really exciting to be at the bleeding edge of such a new and quickly evolving industry mm -hmm. what are the more long-term plans looking like for the creative direction of the club are there any collections that you're particularly excited about or any direction you're excited to take it in yeah i think i think the whole journey of it's exciting the conversation is yeah. exciting like even just hearing you say that it just it's exciting yeah. Like there's, there's, there's so much in it. Um, we have been working on a few things and I think sometimes everyone, you know, when these appointments are made, everyone looks for who are they going to be collaborating with next? Mm. Is it going to be Louis Vuitton? Is it going to be Hugo Boss? And I'm just like, sometimes it's not just about that. I think the exciting project for me is how do we redefine what is sold in the club store? Okay. And that's just down to shapes and silhouettes. Yeah. That could be down to going from like, you know, these traditional tech fit, track suits to something a bit more loose fitting yeah. a bit more draping flat there we go <laughs> do you know what I mean it's like how do we then redefine that but make those staples within the club store mm. like, and I think that is the beauty of it and then telling the stories behind it you know again I, you know, I just go back to Ronnie Feig and Kif they just released a collection and it was dope uh, for New York and what he done is he got all of the you know for, for the shoot he got like New York legends like in all of their areas wearing apparel. And then he had this dope pop-up store in, in the stadium. They had like a full range of like a, a kid's collection. I think this is just the beautiful part of it. Cause I think the good thing about, you know, sometimes people have come from more of this design background, they understand how to utilize community through the apparel. Okay. I think that's just the same thing that I just want to implement here at Crystal Palace. It's just about speaking to starting off with inner city London, and how do we communicate, again, as I said, with, you know, the many people and voices that make up the club. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that's kind of untapped is, especially being a South London team, yeah. their tagline is South London and proud. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, man. So there's beautiful elements to that that we can and should be utilising. So I think ultimately it's just about saying, okay, listen, let's just do some dope stuff. You know, I can't pin it to any collaborations or anything as such just yet, but we just want to have dope moments, have fun doing it, and just allow the fans to kind of like feel good in those positions yeah. yeah making that store an exciting place to be you know i remember going to the mega store at united when i was little and buying the little kits that you'd hang in your car rear view mirror and yeah. that kind of stuff but it just looked like a jjb inside you know it was just yeah. steel racks whatever but mm -hmm. um you know someone that's got an eye for what an exciting store looks like and feels like when yep. you go in it like you you know you were those pop-up stores that you experienced through your own brand and through the brands around you yeah when, you know creating that excitement in there i can see how that yeah. uh, 
be next on the cards. Mm. Yeah, excited to see it. Exciting, very exciting. Um, and for you personally, what mm. has been getting you excited as a fashion consumer? What have you been buying, looking at recently? I haven't really been buying anything. Okay. I haven't. Stacking, I'm, stacking the pay for. Yeah. I'm, you know, it is, I think sometimes as a business owner, it's funny it's because every now really for me, just maybe not really for me because I don't, I like, spend, I do like fashion, but um, at the stage that I'm at currently, everything is focused on reinvesting. Mm. So when I look at, you know, the mailroom is still self-funded. Um, so that New York trip wasn't paid but for by anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for me, I'm, re I'm just at a stage where I'm just reinvesting everything yeah. that I have. But outside of that, if I'm honest with you, what's exciting me? I think I'm just enjoying the conversations from a distance. Okay. Because there's a lot of dope stuff happening. Again, I, I think creatively I'm, I'm loving what Clint is doing. And I think just from a marketing perspective, Trapstar, Mikey, you know, and the rest of the guys, uh, Will and Lee, um, I've always admired what they've done. Yeah. So even just to see, I think they teased like an Averix collaboration, which I thought was amazing. Like the, the the video for it was dope. Yeah. They're always creating in good stuff. Look, I as I said, I'm a, I'm, I'm a streetwear baby man. If I'm honest with you, um, I think one thing that's interesting that I think's kind of gone under the radar, or people are mostly not picking up, is the investment in athletics and track and field for the Paris Olympics. Okay. So if you know Stefani Ashpool, who was um, the founder of Pigalle. I don't, go on. Okay, and I don't know if you've seen in, in France, in Paris, they have like this really colorful basketball court. So that was him. Um, he had a partnership with Nike as one of their main cultural collaborators. Um, and that basketball court just became iconic. He's all about community. Um, and recently his partnership with Nike ended, but it was like a very long stint that he had with them. He is now signed with Lecoq Sportif, which is a very interesting one. Man, yeah, I haven't thought about that brand for a while. Exactly. So for someone like him to be at Lecoq Sportif, my ears pricked, I thought, I mean, yeah. this is interesting. Then he became the creative director of the Paris Olympics 2024. Again, no one's talking about this. Yeah. But for me, it was an indicator. So I saw that and I was like, I saw like he's designing the team kits. For the French team, I was like, okay, this is getting really interesting. And then you see signals of LVMH wanting to get into the Olympics. No, not wanting to, they've invested into it. Yeah. Then Off-White recently done a campaign all on track. Like, so there's a lot there. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot now that people are, it's not just football, other people are starting to look at other sports and seeing what they can do to attach. I think that's what's interesting for me. And it's not just about the high end. The low end, again, sorry, I'm just going to use Clint again because I forgot that actually just tail back in on, into it. With the pieces that he's doing and the videos that he's releasing from a marketing pr perspective with, I think he's, his director's name's Walid, I can't remember his last name. Yeah. They done like rules the world racing, but then they had like these full racing like kits and then they had like the Subaru cars and, you know, like I love that creative element of it, but instead of Subaru, he's like branded it in his own way. Like these are the things that I'm excited about. Do you know what I mean? Where people are seeing the tie between sports, fashion, like entertainment, luxury, music, and just creating this one big ball of like expression. That's where I'm looking at now. Nice man. No, yeah, I, yeah. I ask this question to people, and they normally tell me that they want a new coat for the winter and then you come with like, it's the holistic, the story that yeah. surrounds it that's the most exciting. Mm, yeah, no, no, no. There's no, no items that I want to buy at the yeah. moment. I'm not, I'm, I'm not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Mm. On a scale of one to 10, how much do you care about clothes? Oh gosh, that's an interesting one. It's tricky. Because I say I care about it a lot and then I don't. The reason why I say that is because for me, fashion is a form of expression. You can pin people to communities, culture, ethnic backgrounds, peer groups, or like social groups, sorry, should I say, financial status sometimes. Um, so sometimes it's important. Can, I know people are like, I'm not into fashion, but wearing clothes, you're, there's something you're into. Everyone has a personal sense of style. But, and there's that part to it, dress how you feel. But then the other side to it is, don't allow it to overconsume you to the point where that's, becomes your soul identity. There's a thin line between those two. You don't want to be too shallow. You're not too shallow. You don't want to be shallow, but you want to be expressive. But then again, in someone's world, that what might be shallow and 
is them being expressive. Mm. Just do what you want. Yeah. But, it's, it's, but for me, it's important. Um, because it makes it makes you feel good, dress good, feel good. Like you can always tell someone they're having an off day or they're not really feeling. They'll just fling on something. You'll be like, nah, I just flung on this because I felt like this. Everything is about expression. So for me, it's important because it's an outward expression of how you feel internally. Sick. For me, anyway. Buzzing answer. <laughs> Thanks a million for doing it, dude. Appreciate it a lot. Oh, thank you for having me, man. Amazing, amazing platform, man. And listen, I think there's so many more conversations to be had. Ah, and cheers, we will get Daryl on this platform. Nice too. one. <laughs> Look forward to that. Thank you. Definitely for sure. Kenny and I'm Jonathan. That dude is shaking it up. Total inspiration. Big thanks to him for sharing the knowledge and the insight. And thanks to you lot for being here. If you like this app, then go onto your podcast app and drop us a five-star review. If you've got a little box to write something in, then do that too. I'd love to hear what you think of the show. Cool, that's a wrap for this app. We'll be back with some very sick Fitbit breakdowns in a couple of days. See you back here for that one.